So I once saw this movie about the Holocaust, and out of all of the really heartbreaking stories in it, the one that stuck with me the most was about a mother who was escaping with her baby from the camp when a guard comes by, and so she has to hide. Of course, right then, her baby starts to cry, and so out of panic, she puts her hand over the child's mouth. When the guard finally leaves, the mother lets go with this huge sigh of relief, only to find that her baby had been suffocated by her own hand. The question of what is necessary in order to survive has never been far from me. My dad grew up very poor in the midst of the Cultural Revolution in China, and he had witnessed the chaotic horror of a nation turning in on itself. Persecution, extreme violence, and starvation were everywhere. His body may have left, but his mind never did. To him, the world was a battlefield, and life was about survival. As a child, I got to witness just how strong of a hold these demons still had on him. Like a typical Asian parent, my dad always made me play piano, and he had to work extra hard just to pay for it. But I was just a kid, I didn't know that, and so I just knew I didn't like practicing. We always struggled over it. This one specific day, though, in fourth grade, I decided, hey, why get so upset about it? Let's just have some fun with it. So I started practicing in this playful way, humming, swinging my feet, and singing. He must have read it as ungrateful, because the next thing I knew, his hands were around my neck, choking me in the middle of a note. When I looked in the mirror afterwards, my neck was covered in bruises. In times like that, my father was a black rage with soulless eyes. I still loved him, though. This was the same father who tied a sweater around his head and talked in funny voices to make me and my friends laugh, who surprised me with gifts and carried me on his shoulders at Disneyland. So I tried to speak about happy things to him to help him chase away the darkness. I told him about the way I saw life, how everything was soaked in the beauty of possibility that even just a burst of color on the side of an abandoned building could fill my heart up with the radiance of a new dawn. I wanted to give him some hope, just one sliver. But he could never hear it. My dreams and my hopes were just dangerous weaknesses to him. He would slam his fist down and call me a dreamer, spitting that word out at me like a poisoned dart, the heat of his glare burning down at me from across the table. To him, Love was about protection. Survival was more important than happiness. And hope, hope was for the weak. By the time I was in college, I got tired of trying to change his mind. I didn't want to disappoint him. He had worked so hard to bring me to America to give me a good education in life. At the end of the day, I just wanted him to be proud of me. So I tried his way. I stopped talking about my dreams. After graduation, I got a job in investment banking. They didn't care about creativity, feelings, or beauty. They just wanted someone with a murderously competitive drive and balls, like huge Herculean steel balls. <laughs> I told myself that I was going to survive my way into happiness. And survive I did, but happiness was nowhere to be found. I was working over 60 hours a week. This didn't include the nights that I spent with clients who groped at me and invited me up to their room like I was an expensive hooker. I wondered how I'd ended up here after four years at an all-women's college. But the worst part was recognizing the facade. Everyone was pretending like what they were doing was important and fulfilling. I could see they were all just trapped by the money. Their sense of self was so tied up to their bank account that they no longer had any personal meaning or meter of value. They kept climbing up that ladder, further and further into a cynical numbness. They enjoyed laughing at poor people spending time debating who had a bigger boat, and complaining about their $200,000 bonuses in the midst of one of the worst recessions in recent American history. Outside of work, I became involved in a very unstable and intense relationship. The more of a roller coaster it was, the more I felt alive in comparison to the dullness of my reality. Romance became my new avenue for meaning. The enormous energy of my hopes and dreams, unable to be contained, simply transferred their focus. After the relationship ended, I pored over self-help and psychology books, turning myself inside out in order to figure out why I had been attracted to a relationship like that. Over a year later, I was let go during a wave of layoffs. I decided to see if my dreams weren't so foolish after all. Maybe there was a way to have a career that was both me meaningful and stable. I realized that I loved working with people at a deep and personal level. So I went to school for marriage and family therapy. It felt good to be finally pursuing my own dreams, but I also felt a lot of doubt. 
Was I following my dreams or becoming a foolish dreamer? When I began actually working as a therapist, the doubt only got louder. I loved my job, but it was missing the big picture impact that I wanted. At the same time, I met someone at work. Cautiously, I decided to try dating again, hoping that things would be different this time. But I soon found myself on that same familiar roller coaster, intensely on one moment, anxiously off the next. My moods changed constantly, depending on his. I didn't understand why, after trying absolutely everything, I was back here again, in this place, this needy black hole. Desperate for some answers, I decided to try a Codependence Anonymous meeting. I was shaken by how much I saw myself and all the people who shared their stories that night. So when I finally spoke, my hesitance could not hold back against the wave of tears that rushed forward. I told them of how pathetic I felt that I was a therapist and I couldn't even handle my own relationships, how much I wish I didn't care about love. In my head, I heard my father's words loud and clear, but this time, they were in my own voice. They said to me, I told you so. You and your pathetic dreams. And in that moment, I could not argue with it. In that moment, I hated my dreams for making me feel so foolish and weak. That relationship soon ended, and I began a slow climb out of that bottom. I made another career move and began my PhD in leadership studies. I began to work on myself spiritually instead of just psychologically. But that night remained lodged in the back of my head like a splinter of doubt. In a dead spot, a dullness remained somewhere under the surface, always. Were my dreams foolish? Was my hope a weakness or a strength? It wasn't until recently that I had the opportunity to find out. During one of my leadership courses, the professor asked us to do an interesting exercise, to read a poem of personal significance out loud in front of the class and then sing the main feeling of the poem. She didn't mean a song, no, just one sustained note, no rhythm or lyrics, just true feeling captured in a call and sent out into the world, all in front of a class of over 100 people. I volunteered to go up and read a poem by Mary Oliver called A Visitor. It's about how the author, now an adult, is able to recognize her father in his imperfection. He has his own disappointments and failed dreams. In realizing this, the author begins to see that forgiveness is now possible. After I read it, the professor suggested that the main feeling was love, but for some reason that didn't feel right. Then, someone in the class suggested hope. Hope. There was that word again. My heart started to beat, and the room seemed to brighten. I felt hope rise in my chest like a golden bubble wanting to make its way up and out of me. But I was scared. I could hear my dad's voice, the rage that my childish dreams brought out in him, his hands around my neck when I sang that day, and I couldn't help but feel afraid that that bubble of hope was going to choke me on the way out. So I sang, but timidly at first. My professor knew that immediately, and she pushed me to try again and again. After being up there for almost 20 minutes trying to get it right, I was down to my last chance to really project hope out into the world through a note. I stood there caught between the memory of how much pain and sadness had come out of me when I really let go of that Codependence Anonymous meeting and the strange knowledge that somehow, if I could let go, a profound truth would be revealed to me, the answer about my hope that I had been waiting desperately for. So I closed my eyes and I asked myself, what do you hope for more than anything else in the world? And suddenly I saw myself as a little girl, happy and laughing as I rode my bike around under a big blue sky, reading books about beautiful human stories and dreaming of fantastic things. And I knew then, without a doubt, that the one thing I most hoped for more than anything was just to be finally, without fear, without pain, without worry, free to just be myself. And with that, I opened my eyes and sang. The sound that came out of me was like a light beam. It sliced through my entire body and blew it open with light. Everything suddenly burst with color. There were comments from the class on how that note had a raw, courageous quality to it that had been deeply moving and inspiring. As I went to sit down, I could feel my body trembling. 
I began to cry. For the first time in so long, that dead spot, that dullness was gone. I felt truly alive and whole. It was as if that note had drilled right down into my core and struck magma, hot, brilliant, and alive. I saw very clearly then that hope was not weak, but powerful beyond measure. It was what had kept my father going through very real and huge obstacles to bring us here and establish a new life. It kept me never giving up on finding my purpose and passion, and it kept me getting up and opening my heart again and again after every heartbreak. As I look out into the world and into history, I see the power of hope confirmed over and over again. It is in the rally cries of young people, the calls of revolutionaries and civil rights leaders across the globe, and the simple kindness of a child's forgiveness. We're not so different after all, my father and I. We're just singing different songs. What seemed like a dream to him, stability, food, and freedom of speech is thankfully reality to me. My dreams can go further, to a world beyond the battlefield. I can dream of a world where community and justice exist alongside beauty and joy, and love is more important than money. I don't have to just survive. I get to live. It is for this reason that I have since vowed to never again suffocate my voice of hope. There are so many people like my father and like that mother and her baby who have to stifle their voices just to survive. Those of us who can use our voice therefore should. The world needs us to. For in the end, it will not be our silence that cuts through the darkness, but our hope. In the end, it will not be our pessimism and jaded cynicism that illuminate the path to a new dawn, but our dreams. And so, as if I have a universe that stirs restlessly in my heart. I sing. I sing a song of life, of freedom, and of love. But most of all, I sing a song of hope.